wondering, non from Susanne Tolkien, told you, I'm from uh, natural science faculty, and natural science people tend to calculate. So that's also what you are going to do in the assignment. You have to multiply and add up some stuff. But that's, yeah, that's the way we do research. My research line is on the environmental impacts of food, so I give you a short introduction, or short half an hour, then you yeah. may play around with the assignment, and then after lunch we wrap up. So what I present is more or less what I also teach, and some extras. So this is my research line, environmental impacts of, uh, of our menus. If we go to environmental impacts, most of you think about this. This is pollution. And it's factories that do the nasty work. And if we think of environmental impacts of food, then we think about this. Things we put our food in. And po pollution that it's giving. So the normal the uh, perception of the public, pollution is with fa uh, factories and the only pollution related to food is actually the weapons we do around. That's not the case. We assume that this is green, nice, and the best you can have, this beautiful lady. But actually she is polluting more than this one. So the pollution from cars, from a car, is far sm is less than the pollution from a cow. So the Dutch scenery is meadows with cows in it, and we consider this as green, beautiful, and the place to be. But actually, a meadow with cows is the same as a queue of cars. So this is the problem we uh, recognize in our discipline, is that actually people think that food production and farmers are something green and nice. And it actually isn't. So we really have to fight to get this new idea in that it's actually our food is really polluting and we have to do something. And that's changing when I started to study this, to work on it 20 years ago. If there was a conference on food and pollution, then there were 20 people in it. And if it's now, then there are 200. So in the last 20 years, I saw big change in both the scientific and the public uh, thinking about food and pollution and the global future. So this is the field I work in. And we did a lot of work uh, on just calculating what's the pollution of our food. And what we recognize is that about 30% of the land on the global scale is used for food production. And that means you know, your meadows where the cows are in, arable land where farmers are plowing, that type of stuff. But 70% of the fresh water is already in use. And this is a lot. Fresh water is the, the stuff you can drink, not the one that's in the ocean. But fresh water, already 70% of, uh, of it is on a global scale in use for food production. If you know that there's some, in the future, some more people will be there, and then know when they actually will already use 70%, then you already feel the tension. Next to this, 20% of our energy has to do with food. And it's food for and it's energy for transport, it's energy in uh, heated glass houses, it's also energy required to run machines, to make fertilizer, etc. So a large share of the energy we use has to do with food. And it also is the energy we use in our households, the fridge, the microwave, etc. If you calculate and all these machines making you able to prepare your meals are actually 20% of the energy requirements of your houses. Next to this, the resource use, there's environmental impacts like deforestation, eutrophication, well, the whole list. And if you really have a good look at what's happening, what's causing deforestation, and it's not that we need wood for our furniture or whatever, but we need the land for growing soybeans or whatever. So the big deforestation in the Amazon, etc., is not because we want to have a wooden chair, but we want to have soybeans for our meat or for our own uh, consumption. So most of the big environmental impacts on a global scale, you can 
recognize that it has to do with food production. So these are the big problems caused by food, how to solve it. Because this is the main problem. If the environmental impact is caused by cars or by transport, you can decide, well, let's travel a bit less. Consumption, you don't have the option to stop eating. The only option you have is to eat something else. A stop eating is really the best solution for this globe, because it will also reduce the population a lot, but it's not an option. So the only way to go on is have a look at what we are eating and whether there's something in the menus that we can change so that our menus will have a lower impact on the environment. So this is the coming big challenge. There will be more people. Presently the food system is already the largest problem on earth and how are we going to combine this? And that's the work I mean, and a lot of PhD students, etc. Um, so this is where we, what can we do? How can we change by changing? Changing what we eat. So we went back in, what are we actually eating? And if you're interested in food and what people are eating, this is a great book. It shows pictures. What they did, they went uh, around the world, making pictures of families with their uh, weekly um, groceries, or the, the food they were consuming on a weekly basis. So there's 50 pictures of families with the food, and I think that even recently there's a Dutch version from it, because it really shows something. This is, for instance, the German family, so it's the, the family nearest what we are doing. This is a lot what they are eating, but you can recognize it. So if this is on your table, you know what to do. Um, what they say is that these people are consuming this. Well, I'm not so sure. There's two adults here, and if you see the amount of drinks here, then I'm not so sure that they were, will be able to consume this in a week. But you see, over here there's, and, and there, there's meat, there's a lot of juices, etc. There's um, pizza and cheese and whatever. This is food you can recognize, you know what to do. And if you do shopping on a weekly basis, this is what's happening on your kitchen table. This is the other extreme. This is a family in Africa also showing what they are consuming in a week. And this is not, uh, this is good food. The family is also happy, they are proud on what they have and what they are consuming. You, would, you haven't a clue what this is, how do you make a proper meal from this. So these people are consuming agriculture products and the people in Africa or in, West, or in Germany, they were consuming food products. So you can see the difference. This is agriculture. And what is consumed in, in the Western world is stuff that has been in the food processing industry. Between the farmer and the consumer, some industry has done something. He made uh, pizza from it or whatever. But a large share of the people in the world consume agriculture products. And they consume stuff like this, beans, grains, etc. And this is nice stuff because you can store it without a fridge. There's no, our food needs to be cooled to keep it well. This type of food you can keep it without any energy. So these are the extremes on a global scale and what people were eating. This is all, uh, consumption patterns are not stable. Anybody knows what this is? Yeah, potato eaters. 
It is, it's a picture from a family in the southern Netherlands, 80, 1880. And actually they, those people were mainly eating potatoes. So it looks a lot like this African people also eating agricultural products. And they are also eating something that can be stored without a fridge. So if we go back in our own consumption, then we recognize this what we call staple food diets, people eating really the basics that their surroundings are providing. So if we really go back in all places in the world, you can recognize that people eat something that's there and what can be kept under the normal circumstances. There are also people that have a full meat diet. Any clue where? Yeah. yeah. So the Eden meat that's a real northern part of uh, the, the northern hemisphere. They have a full meat diet. They eat fish and seals. And they can keep it because it's always cold there. So, but people really eat, but the nature supplies them without energy. That's the real start of all menus. And as soon as they become a bit richer, they change. There's also studies on these Inuits in the northern parts of the northern hemisphere. As soon as they got a bit richer, they start to eat uh, pasta and tomato sauce. So people tend to go for a more diversified diet. So something that menus from one day to the other change. So this is our uh, the history of Western Europe. So 100 years ago, or 150, we were eating things like that. Well, McDonald's is already in China. It's also in, in uh, India. And for a large share of the world, this, you see this change to more luxurious diets coming in. So on the globe, diets are changing. And then it's interesting to have a clue what's are the consequences of these changes for the resources we need to produce the food. So, we really have to know something about what's the environmental impact of this one ingredient in our menu. You've seen the uh, picture of the, best, of the people in Germany. It's only a small share of what you can buy in supermarkets here, so imagine that you want to have the environmental impact of all these products at Albert Heijn or Jumbo, then it's a lot of work. And it is to do that uh, the environmental impacts are everywhere. So there's a methodology to how to uh, calculate this. And what we do if we want to calculate the environmental impact of a certain product, we really start from the beginning and start adding up what the farmer is doing, etc. And finally, we have the total amount for one product. So we first figure out what is this farmer doing to produce potatoes or wheat or whatever. And then we calculate the amount of diesel in this machine and the amount of hours, etc. So we can calculate it from this. And then we can also, if we use it as an animal feed, you can calculate how much feed is needed to provide, to make a kilo of pork or a liter of milk or whatever. And then you go on and then you say, well, some products need to be, uh, we need to do something. So this is sugar factory in the Netherlands. You can also look for making vegetable oil or whatever. There's also energy needed in these factories to make something. And we go on. Well, there's also supermarkets with a lot of energy because it's, there's uh, fridges and there's lighting and whatever. So we also talk <coughs> about how much is used here. Then there's a lot of transport. And uh, that's all these things we, count, we add up. And then we have the amount in a certain product. It's enormous work, so it, it took us nearly 20 years to make this kind of databases. Because you have to do this for bread, but also for different types of bread. So you have to do it for vegetables and whatever. So you have to make a selection. 
was just starting to do one vegetable and then the next and whatever. No, that's not going to work. So we use more or less typical uh, ingredients. So we first started to do this with energy. And then we have tables like this. So this, this column is what we calculated for energy and it's ex expressed in megajoule kilo. And when we manage this, then we did it for land. So we calculated how much land is needed to make a bread. And we also did it. Now we didn't do it for water because in the uh, University of Twente, they started to do a heavy, uh, large water footprint product, project. And they did the calculations for water. So now we have more or less overviews of what different parts in our menu are requiring. And there's huge differences. So if we go for potatoes, for instance, there's only 12, 2 megajoules per kilo needed to produce. So that's the really environmental, less requiring product. If we go to meat, then it's nearly 100. So if we calculate the amount of energy needed to make a kilo of meat, then it turns out to be 50 times as large is doing potatoes. And that has to do with the fact that, well, you need energy for the housing of an animal, you need to be in a heated, sometimes in a heated stable, but you also have to feed this animal something. And most of the feed is coming from uh, uh, Brazil, so it is shipped, and soybeans are grown in Brazil, shipped to the Rotterdam Harbor, and then fed to uh, pigs and all these steps if you start adding up you can calculate it it's about 90 megajoule kilo needed yeah um why from like soybeans or? yeah that's what we do is we we, um, we first have a look at how things are produced and then it turns out that in the Dutch situation we import soybeans from Brazil to ship it to Rotterdam Harbor then put it on a truck for to Brabant, where the largest um, pig population is, and we feed it to pigs in there. But it can also be for um, um, for, for other meat products. It's something else. But we first have a look how it's produced here, and then we trace back. But there might be uh, meat production systems that require less. But we first tried to have an overview of what are we consuming in the Netherlands and can we calculate something. But in other, if, you, if you find data from another um, country, then in general these, all these values are a bit different. Because a farmer in, um, in Africa is producing in a different way. He's not importing soybeans from Brazil. He's just growing his own feedstock and provide it to its own animal. So, depending on where you are in the world, you have different values. But this, this is a bit, gives some insight, let's say that one. Um, so, meat is a large thing here. There's also, I think coffee is huge. But it's a megajoule per kilo. And this is kilo coffee beans. It's not kilo coffee in a cup. So that's, you need only seven gram for a kilo, for a mug of coffee, so it's, if you compare on a dish, it's something else. But coffee requires a lot. There's a lot of processes required, there's a lot of traveling. It also requires a lot of water. So coffee is actually per kilo far worse than meat. There's another one, interesting, and that's the vegetable oils. They also require a lot of energy and a lot of land, a lot of water. And uh, in itself, it can be explained because uh, yields per hectare of, of soybeans and sunflower seeds, etc., are low. So if you use these seeds and press the oil out of it, then obviously you need a lot of land to make a liter of oil. But if you think it's your own way of cooking, there's a lot of oil that you're actually not consuming. Because this thin, the, the dried tomatoes in 
oil, olive oil or whatever oil. You get the dry tomatoes out and then there's this jar of oil, sometimes with herbs. And then you have a problem, because you try to do this in, the, in your salads or put it on your pizza or whatever. And that's the same as the oil in uh, fish in oil in tins. A lot of the oil that's actually used to wrap something is thrown away. <coughs> and then we have this product, vegetable oil. And actually it's used as a way of storing stuff. We put it in oil and then we can keep it. But most households just throw this oil away while it's a major impact on the environment. So just change something in food industry, stop using vegetables, oils as a way to store your food products. Could save a lot. So these are typical values. And you can use this trying to figure out what's the environmental impact of your menus. And that's what you actually are going to do later on. There's a list, a bit more detailed than this one. Have a look whether that's... Um, yeah, so we first did it ourselves. So what we have did is, well, we know what's in, it, in something. So square meters in the bread and uh, square meters in meat and whatever. And then we have to look at our menus. And just you can find it on the uh, uh, fooding center of FAO or whatever. Those, those uh, organizations provide insight of what people are eating in different parts of the world. And we start to calculate what's just adding up. So people are eating so many this bread and this amount of meat, etc. And then you can give a picture of what people are eating in different countries. So if you only eat this, what we call staple food diets, so that's the potatoes from the potato eaters, but also what the people in Africa were eating, this, this very basic this is the simple way of consumption. Only bread, potatoes, that part. Then you have the lowest amount of environmental impact. As soon as you start eating meat, it doubles. And it has to do with the fact that you have to put food in an animal, and in most of the times you need about five times as much many calories of grain to get one kilo of um, meat. So this is the first thing, and this is already known in public, so this, this idea of becoming vegetarian is very much based on this. Half of our environmental impact of our menus has to do with meat. But meat is not the only one, we figured out from the earlier table, so next step is actually vegetable oils. So all the oils in our menus also contribute a lot to What's the environment, our environmental impact? Then coffee and tea, etc., are adding up. Beer and wine, actually, also. And then finally, we throw away a lot. That's also large. 20-30% of our food is thrown away. And that is also contributing to the environmental impact of our consumption. So reducing uh, the waste is also an option to do something on the environmental impact. But this is not easy. It looks like, well, stop throwing away, but things are thrown away for a certain reason. People don't throw away food because they like throwing away food. They throw it away because it's too much, they can't keep it, it, has, it doesn't have the proper quality, that type of reason. So, Stop throwing away. It's easy to be said, but there are reasons why people throw away, and as long as these reasons are not solved, people will stay. So this is actually the picture details on resource use in food systems. So what we see is that in, in general, the, yeah, sorry. I have one question to the slide yeah. before. 
I was wondering why dairy products like milk and yogurt and butter are not in there, or are they included? They, they in are the meat? in the meat uh, okay. thing. Because in dairy is mm -hmm. the same as meat actually. So what we see is that this is real staple food diet is the best, or has the lowest impact. Uh, meat is causing a lot, but there's a lot more in those diets that also require a lot of uh, resources. So, if you eat this, then actually you eat this from a resource base. So, you double as soon as there's some meat somewhere, it and you get, now over here, meat on the... On the and the bun is already actually the same as eating five ones. It has to do that you need five kilos of uh, of grain to produce one kilo of meat. And if you go for dairy, then it's even worse. Um, so, so what we did is actually um, we had insight in what people were eating on the globe on the average. We knew the environmental impact in this case, land use, for the different ingredients. And then you can have a look at the large data sets from the FAO, for instance, that provides overview over 50 years of food in different countries in the world. So, this is what we got from the FAO. And they provide the average menu in the world in calories and in different ingredients. So over here it shows it's the agenda and you can see the, the, the real brown one that's uh, the, the animal products, so that's meat and, and uh, dairy. This is on a global scale what people are eating. So a large share, the, the yellow one, that's still the grains. So it's it's the real the cereals, so it's wheat and rice and maize, etc. So, on, in a calorie basis, on a global scale, 30 board, you know, so it's nearly half is actually the grains and about 10% uh, of the calories is in meat. So this is what we know from the, from, uh, the FEO uh, consumption patterns. Then we can calculate how much land is needed when people are eating this because we have this insight in how much is square meters is there for a kilo of meat, and etc. Then you see a funny thing, that on a global scale, the land required per person drops. And in 50 years, you see a heavy decline. That's what's happening here. And you can explain this from uh, the increase in yields. If a farmer has a higher yield, then in principle, the square meters per bread or whatever drops. And so that's, that's what's happening here. So you see on a global scale yields are increasing and as a consequence the square meter per person are dropping. But this is per person. And in this 50 years there's also an increase in population. And then you see that it's going up. So per person the land required for food drops on a global scale, we, the total land required to feed the population is increasing because there are things, different patterns affecting each other. So this is global. And what you also can see that on a global scale, more food became available over the last 50 years. And there's some, in principle, more things to eat per person. So this is more or less history. And then you can split up. Over there again. No, this is uh, this is the our family in, in um, Germany. These are the data from Western Europe. So actually, this is a big, another way of presenting this. This is data, and that's yeah, more insights. Um, if you compare this to the uh, earlier picture then you see the meat coming in. So over here, Western Europe, 30% of our calories has, to, has an animal origin. 
that's all right, while in the global scale it was only 10%. So we see a huge increase of the amount of meat. You can also see that the amount of uh, grains are dropping. Yeah, on the global scale it's more than half, and over here it's only 30%. And there's a lot of other fuss coming in. So the, the, uh, the oils coming in, uh, the, the coffee and the tea. So this is typical for Western Europe. And if we compare to the land required, then we see that actually two-thirds of our menu Two-thirds of, uh, of the land required has to do with our meat consumption. So although it's only 30%, the real, if you add it up for our consumption, then it turns out that you need half. And if you start multiplying with this, this with the number, you see the, well, a huge amount. But the funny thing is that because in Western Europe, populations are not changing anymore, we see leveling off. So in global scale we see an increase, Western Europe it isn't. So there's a rich menu but no population growth. Now we also, we did this for, for all countries in the world. So we have a large, I don't want, I'm not going to show you that. I can give you a reference if you want. This is the family in Africa. 5% meat. In it, you can hardly find it here. You see a decline in the food availability, actually. So the upper graph is showing that there has become less food available, and that can be explained by the huge population increase in those countries. But those people are mainly eating the staple foods. So the, the yellow one is, is the cereals, and the orange one is the, the root crops. So that's the potato-like ingredients. So this is Africa. You see a decline in the amount of food over the 40 years we were studying, or sorry, in, in the area needed per person. But if you multiply with the number of people, uh, this is the largest increase in the population. So, so the increase in population is really driving the amount of land needed to feed these people. And then we have, we did this for all countries, if you're interested, and there's a link below and you can find it on the internet. But they're still creating less pollution, right? It's, no. I'm sorry. No, you said West Africa, right? Yeah. They're using their, their like, it's decreased, they're making use of more land. So they use they're, an awful lot of land. Stuff, right? But then in Middle Africa, they, it's like less land, right? Yeah, but they, they need a lot of land, so if you, you can, if you, um, it's obvious that they don't use fossil energy for running their fridge, etc. Yeah. So that's, if you define your uh, environmental impact as using energy, then it's obvious that these people have a lower uh, environmental impact. But because they need so much land, they start to deforestate or, or do something else, and then their environmental impact is somewhere else. So they are not using energy, but they start to uh, cut down forests to make land available for growing their food. So depending on what parameter in, in the environment you're looking for, some production system use less in this. And so for, for energy, this is a great uh, production system, but as soon as you have a look at how much land and how much they need to uh, deforestate or do something else with their surroundings, then they, they show poor. Okay. So it, it's, besides that there's different menus and different population growth, then, then there's also different production techniques. Mm. And there's no easy way out. Because if you choose for this one, then you can say, well, we go for an energy uh, saving uh, production techniques, then the consequence is that you need a lot of, lot of extra land. Sorry. So, you get an assignment. And I found two menus for you. 
de boerenkool met worst uh, menu. En dat is typical 1950 Dutch way of eating. So it's uh, potatoes, cabbage and a piece of meat. And there's another menu, and that's rice and cashew nuts and spinach. And yeah, that's you can find this type of menus on the on the internet. So what I want you to do is calculate from both menus the environmental impacts. So that's, that's the assignment, and you need a bit more because. There's difference. Vegetables are not vegetables. I'm sorry. There's different ways of producing vegetables. So it can be in a glass house. And if you do a glass house, then in general it's heated. And if you go, so this is heated glass house, and you go, the spinach in the menu is grown here. You can see that you need 15 megajoule per kilo to produce a kilo of spinach if it's grown this way. This is the cabbage. Cabbage is grown outside and especially the cabbage in the menu I gave you, it's even able to survive in winter. So it's it manages frost. So you can harvest whole winter. So that's why it's such a typical Dutch uh, thing. Because we were you need vegetables whole year round, and large share of the uh, the winter there's nothing growing, only the cabbages and the boer calls the one. So this is cabbage over there, and then it's only five. So already in the menu in the vegetables, depending on the vegetable you have, there's there's a factor ten here. Then there's also an option for dried ones. So this is the dried tomatoes thing. That's also a lot, and it has to do with the drying process that you need for making these dried uh, vegetables. Um, from the land perspective, it, it changes. The funny thing is, is, as soon as you start growing something in a glass house, yields become higher. And as a consequence, the land needed for a kilo halves. So if you decide, and that's the same we had earlier, if you just you can decide to use a lot of energy and then you have the amount of land needed. And if you say I'm going to save land, then you need to put a lot of energy in. The amount of water needed is more or less the same. But if we go for kilograms for the dried stuff, then it goes up factor eight. But in principle you have another product. If, if there's one kilo of fresh tomatoes and you dry it, there's only 100 gram left. And that's the reason why these values of the dry uh, um, vegetables are that high. So this is for the vegetables. There's a huge variation already. This is for uh, the meat. There's also large differences. For the energy, it's not that much. Besides that, the beef is requiring more uh, than uh, chicken and, uh, and pork. In land, there's a lot of difference. Chicken is really requiring very less in comparison to, to beef and pork. Because if you have one kilo of grain, you can more or less make two, of, no, two liters of uh, wheat can provide you one kilo of chicken because it's a very efficient animal. It converts its, its food in, into kilograms very efficient. If you do this, a, a cow is less, very less efficient. So as soon as you start choosing your meat in your diets, then there's also a choice between the chicken and the beef and the pork and whatever other animals. So depending on what animal you are using, there's another environmental impact. Mm. 